In this video, I'm going to continue my discussion, sort of long overdue, on Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason. So his sort of magnum opus, the critique of pure reason. In the last video, which I put out quite a while back, I talked about what was called the transcendental. So the tr tran transcendental my, my pad is screwing up a little transcendental so in the transcendental aesthetic what we have is some object so it's an object out there in the real world uh, I'm going to draw it sort of as, as a box here but as we saw in the previous video we can't say anything about the object in itself the object out there outside of our mind we can't say that it has any sort of spatial dimensions but uh, well I mean I guess in sort of confirmation of Kant's hypothesis we can't we as humans can't conceive of it without spatial dimensions and so that's why I'm drawing it here with spatial dimensions uh, and so then our senses so whether it's light coming off of it or maybe we're touching it with our hands or something uh, our senses so some information is passed from the object to our senses uh, and this was what we call the a posteriori a posteriori uh, because this was um, this was empirical here so we we gain sort of content in our thoughts so the content in what Kant calls the intuition which is our immediate representation of the object so the content of it so I guess we could say that this is the the content of our intuition comes from these senses but then the intuition uh, brings space space and time to bear on it and that is a priori we don't learn about space and time by experiencing space and time this is something that we already have in our mental faculties that we actually bring to bear and that's how we we conceive of the object as being in space and in time and so what we're going to talk about in the next couple of videos here uh, probably more than a couple really uh, but we're going to talk about the understanding which is the other faculty the understanding the other faculty that Kant says that we use when we sort of when we sort of under well I guess understanding is right there but uh, when we sort of, we sort of have an intellectual comprehension or apprehension of objects and so the understanding brings to bear on our intuition uh, certain structures and these are the structures that are inherent in what he calls what he calls judgment so a judgment is is some structure that we bring to bear on intuition that makes makes sort of the immediate representation in our intuition into some sort of cognizable thing uh, and I'll talk I'll make that a little bit little bit clearer as we go through here and so uh, so through judgment our concepts our concepts so understanding has a priori a priori concepts and through judgment our concepts become become sensible they become sensible so essentially it's like saying that we have this object here through the senses we get a direct representation through it in intuition but then the understanding through this this act so you could say that judgment the act of judgment we imbue some structure which are these concepts here 
onto our immediate intuition and that's what makes makes an object sort of be the thing that it is so from intuition from these senses it's sort of just uh, I guess you could say an unintelligible image of something and then the understanding makes it intelligible so when you look at a tree uh, if it was just pure intuition if it was just the pure intuition you would look at the tree and there would just be kind of the a splotch of of colors that don't mean anything and then so from the understanding using the act of judgment uh, uh, by bringing these concepts to bear on that sort of unintelligible splotch of colors and shapes, we then we then get something intelligible out of it. And so Kant is sort of, has famously sort of said that thoughts, and I'll write this out because it's kind of a, a famous little uh, mantra of his thoughts without without, oops, that should be, without content. So thoughts without content are empty. So content is what we get from the senses. Uh, so I wrote that right here. So thoughts without content are empty and intuitions without concepts, so concepts coming from the understanding without concepts are blind. And so, like I said, we, we get the content of our thoughts uh, from our senses. And so if we didn't have anything coming in from the senses, then there wouldn't be anything here in the intuition uh, that would, that could even possibly become intelligible and so it would just be empty uh, but intuition so if we have the intuition if this object comes into our intuition from the senses but we don't bring any of these concepts to bear then it's blind it's like I said it's sort of just a, a weird I guess splotch of colors and shapes without any sort of meaning to it and so intuitions uh, without concepts are blind so we need the intuitions in order to understand or we need our concepts in order to understand the intuitions and so for intuition uh, so for intuition we were able to kind of divide it in in this way where we said that sensibility sensibility is equal to empirical empirical intuition and so that is uh, that's what we are obtaining through our senses from the object there and then our then space and time so the space and time that we bring to bear on the intuition are what are called the pure intuition which is what the previous video was talking about but then if we so this is looking at intuition so Kant has divided divided our faculties of our mind into the the intuition here uh, and into the understanding so he has divided our mind to the intuition and the understanding and our intuition we can further divide uh, into the sensibility which is the empirical intuition which we can then also say is is the a posteriori and this was uh, the a a priori this is what our our faculty of intuition actually brought to bear onto onto the actual representation and then we can further divide the into or the understanding rather so for the understanding we can divide that and I'll make a nice little 
table for this. So Kant says we can divide this into into pure and applied, uh, but we can also divide it into general and specific. Uh, so Kant doesn't make this table. This is something I made just based on uh, what he talks about in this section of the book. And so he goes through and uh, he he doesn't delineate the pure and applied for specific that clearly, but the way I would understand it is that the the pure specific understanding, uh, the pure specific understanding is the rules of logic. So, so the rules of logic. So this is the kind of stuff that you might learn in sort of a, a logic 101 type class where uh, you talk about, you know, the, the structure of syllogisms and hypothetical statements and stuff like that. Then applied specific would be, uh, would be the use, the use of logic in a in a a particular instance so if you are actually bringing logic to use in for some particular instance say you're writing up a, a philosophy book or you're doing your logic homework then you were using applied specific logic then he says that applied general logic is uh, is sort of what the the realm of psychology is in so this is sort of the realm of of the sci science of psychology the general applied and so on. it's talking about how our mind works uh in application so in our everyday life uh what are sort of the the rules about how our mind works and uh maybe you could even sort of attribute things like like the uh, cognitive biases and things like that to this. So, so how our cognition, our cognition actually works in in sort of day-to-day uh, -to -day life. Uh, but it's general, so sort of general rules. So if you're reading like a psychology textbook, then this is kind of where that would be. But Kant is interested here in the general pure which he calls the the transcendental the transcendental logic and so the transcendental logic is the the sort of structure that our thoughts have to take uh, so the pure general is what he's looking at when he's talking about the understanding they are the the concepts or uh, or the what we will see in the future he calls the categories of understanding and so they are sort of the the they are take all content is taken out of it so it's it's just the form so the the general the general the general pure is is just the form of understanding so the form of understanding without without any specific content without specific content and so these are sort of the things that our our minds bring to bear on on the intuitions in order to make them intelligible and cognizable uh, and that's done through the act of judgment. And then so we can take this transcendental logic, and Kant makes a point, so uh, I'll just call it TL for transcendental logic. And once again, this isn't a table that's in the book. This is something I've made. Uh, and so he breaks it down into analytic and dialectic dialectic 
And what analytic is is uh, is well, this is essentially his project. Here's what he's trying to do. Uh, he calls it the the canon, the canon, uh, sort of like canonical. Um, so the canon, which is, are sort of the the rules, the rules or pure concepts. So it's identifying. It's uh, the analytic uh, is identifying this canon, the rules or pure concepts uh, of the of the understanding. Uh, so used by the understanding by the understanding in order to make our thoughts, uh, make our intuitions intelligible. In the dialectic, he says, uh, well, he doesn't say this explicitly, but it's sort of the realm of what is also often called rationalism. Rationalism, uh, which is the use, the use of, of the concepts the concepts to derive to derive truth statements and so it's uh, it's taking the the uh, pure general understanding uh, so truth statements and att uh, attempting to use it to come up with with statements that are true about the world uh, and Kant um, says that this is illegitimate because it lacks any content from intuition. And so he sort of derides the rationalists for doing, for doing metaphysics, uh, for doing metaphysics using this method, metaphysics, because he's, he essentially says that with using the dialectic, you can come up with statements that support pretty much any position you want and that is sort of where the uh, the sophistry comes from uh, so you can come up with statements that that support any position you want because they the they lack any sort of content because it's all it's all just form so it's it's all form and no content all form no content uh, and so he kind of dismisses this and we're and he's going to look only at the uh, at the analytic here so he this is what he calls the transcendental analytic so the transcendental transcendental analytic and he he enumerates four things that the transcendental analytic must satisfy, and so the first is he says it must be pure, not empirical, not empirical. Uh, he says that uh, that it must belong belong to the understanding rather than intuition or sensibility or anything like that understanding uh, I'll do three over here uh, he says that it must be elementary and so and so the uh, the concepts within the understanding uh, must be elementary they can't be derived from anything else they they can't uh, be composed of any other element, elementary concepts, uh, and he says that it must be complete, which means that it covers everything. It covers all of the field of understanding. You can't add any more to it. It it has to be complete. And so, once again, he goes through two sorts of arguments here. Uh, the metaphysical deduction and the transcendental deduction. Uh, I'm going to talk about the metaphysical, the metaphysical deduction in this video. 
Uh, I will not get to the transcendental deduction until the next video because it's a bit long and involved. Um, and there are actually two of them because he has two different formulations of his transcendental deduction depending on which edition of the uh, of the Critique of Pure Reason that you were reading. And it, when I go through the transcendental deduction, I am also going to uh, going to take some from uh, the 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 book called the Cambridge Companion to Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, edited by Paul Geyer, uh, and he actually points out some flaws in Kant's uh, transcendental deduction that I'm going to discuss. And so I will not get to the transcendental deduction until the next video. But in this video, I will go through this uh, metaphysical deduction. And so the first thing he says is that a judgment, well, this he doesn't say this explicitly. This is my sort of uh, interpretation. Um, so a judgment, a judgment, which is the act of bringing the understanding, the concepts in the within the understanding to bear onto our intuition, uh, is is substituting substituting variables variables in a proposition a proposition and so we have a proposition which would be something like x is p and this is a a sort of general form of it uh, if x is plural we could say x r P. Uh, but anyway, it's just saying that this X, this subject here, so the subject uh, falls under, so falls under, falls under this predicate, this predicate here. So P is a, a predicate. And uh, if, if you fast forward to uh, Gottlob Frege, uh, he he defines a predicate as as a concept, uh, and so that's kind of a way that I like to think about it. So the subject falls under this predicate, and therefore the predicate is is uh, within. So it's within, is contained within the subject, and so when we when we make a judgment. With, through the act of judgment, we are predicating something of a subject. So I said before that, uh, say you are looking outside and you see, you know, a tree here. When it's in pure intuition, it's just some colors and shapes here. Uh, but with the understanding, now you are saying that that this here is, and then the P, the predicate, a tree. Uh, so this here is the X, the subject, and this here is the the P, the predicate. And so that's what makes this image here, this sort of pure intuition, uh, intelligible. We predicate tree uh, on this image, and that makes the intuition intelligible. And so that is what a judgment is doing, is essentially taking this x, x is p, and then actually substituting, actually putting, putting specific things substituted in for these variables here. And so x is p. This image, this subject here, is a tree. And so that makes that image intelligible to us. And so that is what a judgment is. Uh, and so, uh, in I guess what we could say in in Frege's language, uh, we are saying that a specific referent, the tree, is would be a a referent, uh, is is uh, a concept, is a concept. So referent falls under. So the is means that it falls under 
it falls under that concept. And at the same time, we could say that uh, that the concept is contained, contained within, contained within. And so this is uh, essentially what Kant means with a judgment. Uh, and so this is kind of his first premise here. So we could uh, we could identify this as P1, as premise 1. Uh, and then premise 2 in his metaphysical deduction. So we can say P2 here uh, is that that these judgments, these judgments have, oops, have a, a particular, a particular structure. And so the structure of our judgment being that uh, the proposition in this case, so this is a, a judgment that's a proposition and the proposition x is p is the structure of our our concept here uh, and so the structure takes on the form of what i talked about in the previous videos the genus species structure uh, where the genus is the is the concept or or i guess if we want to use uh, Kant's language rather than the more uh, Phrygian language predicate and the species would be the subject uh, and so we have that uh, contained under and contained within relationship here and this is the the structure of a judgment and so then the conclusion from these two premises, so conclusion, uh, is that uh, the concepts of objects must be formed in certain character, in certain characteristic ways in order to be employed by judgments. Uh, and those characteristic ways are the pure concepts of understanding, uh, which are those uh, pure uh, general that pure general logic the transcendental logic uh, and so we can say that uh, so therefore and so this is the conclusion here uh, so to kind of go through it uh, he says a judgment uh, well he a judgment uh, is substituting variables in a proposition uh, and judgments have a particular structure. Uh, therefore, therefore, concepts of objects must be formed in certain characteristic ways in order to be employed in judgments. Uh, and so that follows because he says that uh, that that we that a judgment is sort of impl is sort of employing. Uh, employing these concepts in a certain way uh, and that is in the form of this proposition uh, which means that the judgments have a particular structure uh, and therefore the concepts of objects must be formed in certain characteristic ways in order to be employed in judgments uh, and so that essentially means that the uh, the that there must be certain ways of un of understanding concepts so the understanding so if we go back up here uh, we said that the understanding has these a priori concepts which we have now identified uh, as as the pure concepts of understanding so pure general pure general uh, concepts of understanding and it is saying that these concepts must have a certain structure and it must be the same structure as the act of judgment 
uh, because it's the act of judgment that brings these concepts to bear onto our intuitions. Uh, and so the structure of the judgments must be the same uh, or at least dictate the structure of the concepts uh, in order for them to be uh, employed in those judgments that do have this particular propositional structure here. Uh, and so, um, and so, well, I'll read this and then give sort of a, a simpler, a, a simpler, I guess, analogy for it. Uh, he says, the way our understanding conceives our intuition, which is, an, the intuition is the immediate representation, as objects for judgments, uh, so judgment being predicating concepts, uh, of, of objects or uh, predicating something of a subject uh, is determined by the structures of the judgments themselves. Uh, so I'll read that again. The way our understanding conceives our intuition as objects for judgments is determined by the structures of judgments themselves. Uh, and so the analogy that I have come up with is that the concepts, the concepts uh, are the container, so the container, uh, so that's the, the form, uh, and, and the intuition, uh, so concepts which are under the, the understanding, understanding. Uh, and so the intuition, the intuition would be uh, the contents. So maybe the water, if we're talking about a, a glass or bottle of water. And so this is the, the content. And so when it says our way of understanding, uh, the way our understanding, so the way our understanding conceives our intuition as objects for judgments, uh, so sort of the way that it, it uh, forms, it formulates the content, the way that it shapes the content, uh, so that it can be, uh, so that it can be subjects for our our judgments. Uh, so the way our understanding conceives our intuition as objects for judgments is by formulating them, by forming them into these these particular ways of, 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 of doing judgments, essentially. So it, into the structure of judgments, it, it forms them into the, the structure of judgments, of judgments. Uh, and so it's determined by the structure of judgments themselves. And so when we have this structure, this container, that will tell us what the shape, the shape of the contents of it will be. Sort of the shape, uh, if, we, if we have a, say, a glass that has some weird shape like this, uh, then the water that's inside of it will take on this shape. And so the, the content of our intuitions must take on the shape of the structure of our judgments, essentially, uh, in order for them to be uh, to be intelligible to us, and so Kant goes on to say that the structure of judgments, uh, which he calls the logical functions, uh, fall into uh, into four different types of functions. Uh, so there is quantity, there's quality, there's relation, and there is modality. And so the logical, f and then these are, uh, take on three, uh, forget what he calls them, he has some word for them. Uh, but three uh, different types of quantity, which he says are universal. 
So these uh, logical functions, once again, these are the, the structures of judgment. And so there's quantity, which is universal, particular, and singular. Uh, and in the next video, when I go through the transcendental deduction, and then even more so in the video or two after that, I'll make what all of these things are a bit clearer. Uh, but for now, uh, we will just sort of um, just lay these out here. So quality is affirmative, negative, or infinite. Uh, relation is categorical, categorical, hypothetical, hypothetical, or disjunctive, disjunctive. And modality is either problematic, and these, this wording is, is always kind of weird to me. Uh, I think uh, in the, the next table I will make, it'll be a little bit clear, Asser, Toric, uh, and Apodidic. And so these are the structures of judgment. And so from this, he uh, says that the, the uh, categories of understanding, uh, the categories of understanding, so categories of understanding, which is uh, which is the the structures of concepts structure structure of concepts and so his metaphysical deduction once again is essentially saying that the structures of concepts must be uh, must be the same or at least uh, derivable from the structures of judgment and so I'm going to keep these same four categories here of of quantity, quality, relation, and modality. But uh, when he is talking about the categories of understanding, uh, he then breaks it down into, instead of universal, particular, and singular, uh, now it is, is unity, plurality, and totality. Uh, so if we want to break these down into or separate them out like this uh, so these are this is now under quality he has reality negation and limitation limitation and once again like I said these things will all become a little bit clearer in the next few videos uh, then under relation, he has uh, inherence and subsistence. Subsistence. You can see why I left myself a little more room over here, uh, which um, is sort of the same as substance. Uh, then the next one is causality causality and dependence dependence which is uh, which is looking at things uh, temporally so temporally and then the the third one is community and reciprocity which is sort of uh, looking at things spatially. So I'll put spatial here. Uh, and then modality there is, uh, and these are the modalities that people are more used to 
talking about in modern in uh, modern philosophy so possibility uh, existence and necessity uh, and so just sort of briefly quantity so unity obviously is just saying that there is one of something plurality saying that there is uh, a sum of something and totality saying that there is all of something so this uh, this is sort of uh, one uh, particular this is sort of uh, multiple and particular uh, and then this is sort of uh, universal so universal uh, so reality is saying uh, essentially that there is the thing that is existing in negation is saying that there is the sort of absence of existence and limitation is sort of um, saying that something that uh, is I guess less than infinite uh, then with relation inherence and subsistence uh, and uh, this is substance because Kant uh, uses the sort of uh, older version of of sort of substance uh, substance and accident so the substance is whatever is sort of uh, permanently there so substance is whatever subsists uh, through time in the in an accident is sort of uh, sort of something that um, is contingent uh, and but it 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 inheres I guess uh, it inheres that's what this inherence is it inheres in the substance uh, so accident and substance um, which is sort of the the old scholastic ph philosophy scholastic uh, which this was a really popular uh, topic in school well even in Aristotle uh, so Aristotle and of course these scholastics talked about it because they got it from from Aristotle uh, and it's sort of substance is sort of the thing and then the accident is all of the properties of the thing uh, and so the substance uh, so you can take some object uh, and if you uh, over time you morphed it into some other shape uh, this and this have the same substance uh, where the accident is that this one is a triangle and this one is a circle so the accident is sort of the property of it the substance is sort of the thing that has changed but the this uh, the thing that has changed but it is not itself changed it subsists through time uh, causality and dependence I think is uh, somewhat self-explanatory uh, at least in this quick introduction that I'm giving here uh, but it is the way that um, that a thing uh, changes in time and so uh, and so the cause the cause oops the cause pre, uh, pre precedes the effect and as we'll see in later videos this is not the definition of cause and effect but it is um, something that falls out of uh, the definition or Kant's definition of cause and effect um, but this is kind of a, a useful way of thinking about it that that there is a cause and uh, it does something and then there is it what comes after that something is the effect uh, and then community or reciprocity is spatial um, and so a nice way of thinking about that is if we have uh, two objects out in space uh, then this object is acting on this one uh, through gravity or if these were uh, maybe particles through charge or something but at the same time this one is also acting on this one and so there is this sort of uh, this sort of instantaneous or or uh, 
it's happening at the same time. It's just a difference through space rather than than through time, uh, because this act, this particle acting on this one and this acting on this one, are both happening simultaneously, uh, but they are acting through space, and so community and reciprocity is spatial. Uh, then modality, which uh, I believe Kant thinks of mostly in terms of epistemology rather than uh, than in the metaphysical way that they're often understood today. But possibility um, is is essentially saying that it's possible that something could be the case. Uh, and so I think I used in previous videos if you have. Uh, if you have your front yard here and there is a tree that is placed here, it could have been possible that the tree was in fact placed here. Uh, there's nothing, there's no contradiction there, and so that's possibility. Uh, but of course, Kant understands it more in uh, as an epistemological thing that that um, it is possible we can conceive of this as being the case. Uh, where existence is uh, is what the scholastics would have called actual, and that is that it is actually the case that the tree is right here. And then necessity, uh, so necessity would be essentially saying that it could not be otherwise that the tree is here. It could, the tree could not be otherwise than right there, that uh, that being over here would be uh, would be logically impossible. Uh, and of course, it's not logically impossible for it to be there. So a better way is uh, is thinking about something like the, the square circle. Uh, so if we ignore this, so the square circle is something that is logically impossible. And so it's necessary that it doesn't exist. Uh, and so... Um, something that is necessary is that uh, that one precedes two, uh, or maybe we could say that one is less than two is something that is necessary. Uh, it's logically impossible for it to be otherwise, uh, and so that is what modality is. Uh, and anyway, those are. Kant's categories of understanding. Uh, like I said, in the next video, I will uh, go through his, his, his transcendental, transcendent, transcendental deduction, which, like I said, it takes two different forms. Uh, so addition, addition, one and addition two of the critique of pure reason both uh, proffer different arguments. Uh, and the reason for that is um, Kant sort of recognized, and you know, people in his time told him that his explanation in addition one was was both flawed, flawed, and unclear, and unclear. And so uh, he actually, between the two editions, he he proffers, well, you can see the evolution of his argument between, in writings between the two editions. And then in the second edition, he proffers another, another argument. Uh, but as I said, I will talk about um, uh, Paul Geyer's uh, essay in the Cambridge Companion to Kant's Critique of Pure Reason where he points out that the the argument is is still flawed uh, and it's still uh, a bit a bit unclear uh, and in fact uh, Paul Geyer offers his own version of an argument that Kant should have used uh, given his uh, his metaphysical deduction, uh, what Paul Geyer keeps calling the, the clue, the clue, so the clue from the metaphysical deduction that, uh, that could have made his, 
his uh, transcendental deduction clearer and uh, avoided some of the flaws that he has in it. Uh, but anyway, this will be in the, the next video. Uh, then in the video after that, I will talk a bit more uh, about the system of principles, uh, as he calls it, which is sort of looking at these actual categories of understanding and uh, sort of um, going through them in a little bit more detail and talking about what they mean and why they have to be the, um, the categories of understanding and why they, uh, why they satisfy these, these four things here. And so uh, after the transcendental deduction, I will go through those system of principles and it kind of talks about why the categories of understanding satisfy these uh, four things right here. Um, and anyway, uh, I hope you found this video useful, uh, and I will see you in another video.